Hi everyone, in this lecture we will cover the oral cavity, pharynx, and the temporomandibular joint. So in today's lecture we will quickly go through the main cavities in our head and neck region and then focus on the oral cavity and the pharynx. We will be looking into the structures of the oral cavities and emphasizing the tongue and the temporomandibular joint. Then we will discuss the pharynx and its structure and function, finishing off with the mechanism of swallowing. So let's have a quick overview of the cavities and their functions before we go into more detail. First of all, most superiorly we have the nasal cavity, which is our main airway for breathing. Directly inferior to the nasal cavity, we have the oral cavity, an oral cavity is a starting point of the digestive system and also work as an accessory airway. The nasal and oral cavity is separated by the hard and soft palate. Inferior to the oral cavity, there is the larynx. And as we learned about the larynx, it is an organ that allows us to make voiced and voiceless sound and also this is our main airway. So the most important feature of the larynx is that it houses our vocal fold. Now, the pharynx is located posterior or behind the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, and the larynx. The larynx is a dual purpose tube and has, and it assists in breathing as well as swallowing. Now, depending on the location of the pharynx, the pharynx is divided into three parts. So, uh, posterior to the nasal cavity, we have the nasopharynx. And similarly, posterior to the oral cavity, we have the oropharynx. And behind the larynx, we have the laryngopharynx. Now, the laryngopharynx communicates with the larynx via the laryngeal inlet and the oropharynx communicates with the oral cavity via the fauces, and the nasal cavity communicates with the nasopharynx via the coana, which is the opening of the nasal, nasal cavity. So let's have a look at the main features of the oral cavity. The oral cavity performs three main functions, and these are initiation of digestion, manipulation of the sound, and working as accessory airway. Now, as we all know, the oral cavity is the first area where the food is ingested and prepared for digestion. And the digestion starts in the oral cavity when the food is broken up and um, chewed by the teeth. And these pieces will mix with the di digestive enzyme, the saliva. And while chewing the food, it will, be being, it will be prepared for swallowing, and in other means, it will form the bolus of food. So the oral cavity is also important artic it, it, sorry, the oral cavity is also important in articulation and resonation for speech. And it also works as the accessory airways so we can breathe through our mouth. Now if you can remember the articulator are parts of the vocal tract, which can be used to form sounds, and the oral cavity has the biggest articulator, which is the tongue. So, let's have a look in more detail. Now, I would like you to pause the video clip and review the boundaries of the oral cavity. Now, when thinking of the boundaries, try to remember the principle A2. The boundaries of a space can be actual anatomical structure or defined by landmarks agreed by anatomical conventions. So when we, thinking, when we think about the boundaries of the oral cavity, the best way to do this is to move your tongue around your mouth. Or alternatively, you can use your finger and put your finger inside your mouth and palpate what's, what will be making the boundaries of the oral cavity. So let's spend uh, about a minute, and I wish you guys pause the video now and um, try to answer these questions, the boundaries that makes the oral cavity. So the roof, 
the lateral wall, anterior wall, as well as the posterior wall. So pause the video now and give it a try. Okay guys, so I'm hoping you all have the same answers as I do. So the roof of the oral cavity is formed by the soft and hard palates, and the lateral wall will be formed by the cheek, in other words, the muscle, the buccinator. The anterior wall is formed by the oral fissure and the lips, and the posterior wall is formed by the fauces. Now fauces is a space, and it's where the oral cavity communicates with the oropharynx. So the fauces is also known as oropharyngeal isthmus. So let's have a look at these boundaries in more detail. So starting from the roof, the roof of the oral cavity is formed by the hard palate and the soft palate. Now interesting thing is what is above the oral cavity? That's right, it's the nasal cavity. So the roof of the oral cavity is also the floor of the nasal cavity. So the roof of the oral cavity is formed by the bony hard palate, and these are the anterior two-third of the roof, and the posterior one-third is muscular, and muscular meaning it's soft, meaning it can move. So the importance about the soft palate, or, or the velum, is that during swallowing, the soft palate closes the openings in the oral cavity and the nasal cavity, or the nasopharynx in, in more detail, uh, preventing foods or other particles going into the wrong areas. But we will talk about this in the later slides. So the hard palate, as we said, it's a bony structure and it's formed by the maxillary and the palatine bone. Where, and this uh, hard palate is useful for chewing and mastication and also it helps to form the bolus of food and also it gives a fixture point for the tongue. Soft palate is as we said it's more it's, it is useful for movement during swallowing and when we open our mouth, we will see a dangling part through our opened mouth. And that part is called the muscular uvulae or uvula. And it is part of the five muscles that makes the soft palate. So let's have a detailed look of the soft palate. The soft palate is also known as the velum. And it's made by five muscles. They are the tensor villi palatini, levator villi palatini, palatoglossus, and palatopharyngeus, and the musculus uvulae. So the velum is one of the flap valve of the pharynx. Now before we go into more detail, let's have a look at these video and what happens to the soft palate when we swallow food. So focus on the soft palate when the food is uh, chewed and swallowed. Okay, so at this oral stage, what happens is once the food is chewed from the mouth, what happens to the velum? The velum is depressed and blocking an opening between the oral cavity and the oropharynx, meaning the velum will close the fauces, preventing the food to going into the oropharynx. And when this occurs, it will also prevent the food going into the nasopharynx, preventing the nasal regurgitation. So this is while we are chewing the food. When we are about to swallow it, now the tongue moves the food posteriorly. Now the food is in the oropharynx. Now when the food is in the oropharynx, the velum is elevated, blocking this opening here, which is the inlet between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, again preventing the food or particles or water going into the nasal cavity. So let's have a quick look again when we're chewing. The food goes in, the teeth chews, the tongue moves the food posteriorly, ready to be swallowed, and the velum is depressed, blocking the fauces. 
and the food is moved to the oropharynx, the villum is now elevated to block the opening between the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. So with this reason, villum is known as one of the flap valves of the pharynx. So as the video says, it depressed it went during swallowing, it depressed to close the fauces and it elevates to close the pharyngeal isthmus. And the common insertion point of the velum is the pal palatal aponeurosis. And this is a reinforcement structure for the muscle attachment. Now, when the video that we just saw, it was actually recorded in human as well. So let's first have a look at this video again. And this is an image showing a scope passed through the nasal cavity and go went all the way posterior to the nasopharynx. So the image where that you watch here will be the boundary between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. So let's have a look. So the part you see here is the opening between the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. And this is the wall of the pharynx. And when swallowing occurs, this part is folded up where the velum will be elevated to attach to this point, closing the opening between the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. And this part is known as the passivant ridge. So again, this uh, structure where the arrow is pointing is called the passivant ridge. And the whole uh, movement of the velum closing off the opening is called the velopharyngeal closure. And this is a closure of the pharyngeal wall, and it occurs by raising and tensed velum, and it will contact with the pharyngeal wall, forming a superior fibers of the superior. Uh, this is formed by the superior fibers of the superior constrictors of the pharynx. Oh, sorry. One more thing. The th the Important structures that we can identify where this is located is this structure here. Now, as I said, the scope has been passed through the nasal cavity. And at the lateral wall of the nasal pharynx, if you can remember, we have an opening to the eustachian tube. So this hole is the opening of the eustachian tube. And this elevation is called the torus tuberius, or the tubular elevation, which uh, protects or, or gives a boundary of the opening to the eustachian tube. So this structure clearly shows that we are in the nasopharynx. So when you guys become a clinician and uh, examine the patients, make sure you can identify this structure, which is opening of the eustachian tube, and then you will know that you are in the nasopharynx. <laughs> So this is another image showing the velopharyngeal closure. So the muscles that are involved in the velopharyngeal closure are the superior constrictor of the pharynx and the tensor villi palatini and the levator villi palatini, which elevates the velum and also uvula supports the elevation of the velum. So the main function of the velopharyngeal closure is to prevent foreign objects entering to the airway and also direct air uh, in and out from the oral cavity into the oropharynx. And importantly, as the movement involves the contraction of the tensor villi palatini, this will open the auditory tube. And we will talk about this later, but the tensor villi palatini is the muscle that can open the auditory tube or the eustachian tube. Okay, now let's talk about the posterior boundaries of the oropharynx. Now, if you can remember, the posterior boundary was an opening, so it's a space. So, in simple words, the, the posterior boundaries of the oral, oral cavity is the fauces. And um, the part that's showing the figure here is 
as you can see, the fauces communicate with the oral cavity with the oropharynx. Now, if we, if you guys see in the mirror, or if you take a photo of your inside mouth, you will see a st some structures looking like this. So let's label them and identify what they are. So we have the two arches that makes the boundaries of the fauces, and these are the uh, palatopharyngeal arch and the palatogosal arch. That meaning this muscle is going from the palate, uh, from the palate to the tongue, and also from the palate to the, the pharynx. That's what the name indicates. And in between the palatoglossus and the palatopharyngeus, we have the palatine tonsil. And we can see the soft palate or the uvula on the top and the tongue in the bottom here. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping you guys can identify the structure when you um, look inside your mouth. So I think some of you will rem remember this image, but let's try to identify the structure. So this image, or this diagram, represents the posterior view of our pharynx. So these um, circle, circular structures are the opening. So this is an opening. And again, this heart shape is an opening as well. And I labeled some structures for you guys. So we have the medial pterygoid plate, the eustachian tube coming down here, and this part is the base of the skull. And we have a tongue, the epiglottis, and the palatine tonsil. So pause the video again and try to identify what these black lines represent. And in the diagram, the black line will represent the muscle. So we have one, as a pair, one, two, three, four, and five muscles. So pause the video now and try to identify what these muscles are. Okay, so let's do it together now. So from the top, we have the opening from between the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx, which is a coane. And we know that because I labeled that as a concha. Concha is a structure that is located in the nasal cavity, increasing the surface area for uh, the air to circulate, to be moist, moisturized and be heated. So we have the opening coane. And we have the fauces down here, which is an opening between the oral cavity and the oropharynx. And this structure here, where it's the common attachment point for all five muscles, are the aponeurosis of the velum. And we have the tensor villi palatini up here from the sphenoid bone. And this muscle can open the eustachian tube. Now, next to the tensor villi palatini, we could see the levator villi palatini from the temporal bone inserting into the aponeurosis of the villum. And the arrow moving upwards is our muscular uvula. And we have the palatoglossus, which is attaching from the palate to the tongue. Uh, glossus meaning tongue. And the pal palatopharyngeus, which is from the palate going all the way down to the pharynx. So I'm hoping you guys can identify all these muscles. Now, in the oral cavity, we actually have two spaces. And these are the oral cavity vest, oral cavity proper, and the oral vestibule. Now, in this figure here, it shows the anterior view of the coronal section of the head. And with the mouth closed, the vestibule is the area between the cheek and the outer surface of our teeth. And this area actually communicates with the outside world through the oral fissure, and in other words, the opening of the mouth. And the area inside, the inner, inner part of the teeth, is known as oral cavity proper. And this is where our tongue is located. Now let's have a 
Let's talk about the innovation of oral cavity. Now, there are lots of structure in the oral cavity, and some structures have, have different nerve supplies to others. So let's first talk about the walls of the oral cavity. So the walls of the oral cavity is supplied by the trigeminal nerve. And depending on which part of the wall we're talking about, we have the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, which supplies the heart palate and the upper lip, and the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve supplies the lower lip. Now, interestingly, the fauces, again, the opening of the uh, oral cavity, posterior opening, or the posterior boundary of the oral cavity, is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Now, again, the fauces is a bound is a space. And um, if you think about it, the fauces is also the boundary of the fauce itself is formed by the posterior one third of a tongue. And we'll talk about the tongue later, but the posterior one third of a tongue is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Hence, the fauces is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Now, with the tongue, we will get back to the tongue, but in a brief summary, the glossopharyngeal nerve supplies a sensory and ge general sensation and special taste to the posterior one-third of the tongue, and the trigeminal nerve will give the general sensation of anterior two-third of the tongue, and the facial nerve gives special sensation to the anterior two-third of the tongue. So, when we talk about the nerve fiber type, the walls of oral cavity supplied by the trigeminal nerve is a GSA. Glossopharyngeal nerve is a GVA because uh, the fauces is also part of the pharynx, and pharynx is an organ, so it's a general visceral afferent. So if the question asks what are the three principal nerves to the walls of the oral cavity, they are the trigeminal, glossopharyngeal, and the facial nerve. Now let's talk about the tongue. The tongue is an interesting organ. So, first of all, it is a mass of a mobile muscular organ covered with a mucous membrane. Now, the tongue contains a number of um, mucus and serous glands, and it, house, it houses most of the taste bud. Now, the taste is a special sense. Other sense input to the tongue all allows to detect temperature and texture of the food. And also there is a pain receptor as well. So as ma mentioned a number of times in the previous uh, slide and lectures, the tongue is the biggest articulator and in, that is involved in speech and making sound. And the movement of the tongue also involves to reach the subject, sorry, reach the object inside and outside the oral cavity and also, it mixes the food with saliva. It propels food fluid into the pharynx for swallowing, and it also forms the bolus of food. Now, with the tongue, we can make rapid changes in shape and position for articulation. Now, the tongue is also uh, print, uh, tongue also participates in nonverbal communication as well as cleaning the oral cavity. So, let's talk about the tongue. So, the dorsum of the tongue, or the top of the tongue, has a V-shaped sulcus, and this sulcus is called the terminal sulcus, and it divides the tongue into the anterior two-third and the posterior one-third. So, the posterior one-third of the tongue is known as a pharyngeal surface, and this part sits in the oropharynx. And the anterior two-third of the tongue known as the palatine surface, sits at the oral cavity proper. And we also have the midline sulcus separating the anterior two-thirds of the tongue into left and right. So as mentioned earlier, the tongue is a mass of muscle. There are actually four extrinsic and four intrinsic muscles, making total of 16 muscles of the tongue. Importantly, the intrinsic muscles change the shape of the tongue, and the in intrinsic means both origin and insertion are within the same area. So these muscles are the superior and inferior longitudinal, and transverse and vertical uh, intrinsic muscles. 
And the superior and the inferior longitudinal works together to make the tongue short, thick, and retract the tongue. And the transverse and the vertical muscle do the opposite. Now, the extrinsic muscles of the tongue changes the position of the tongue, and extrinsic means that they have one attachment inside the region, and second, at outside the region. And these muscles are the genioglossus, and hyloglossus, and styloglossus, as well as the palatoglossus. So these um, paired eight muscles, totally making 16 muscles, make the muscles of the tongue. So the four intrinsic muscles, as I mentioned, change the shape and move the bolus of food around the oral cavity and mixes with saliva and remove the food from the buccal cavity. And the intrinsic muscles of the tongue is supplied by the hypoglossal nerve as a motor supply. So the superior longitudinal the superior longitudinal muscle curls the tongue longitudinally and upward, elevating the apex and sides of the tongue and shortens or retrudes the tongue. Whereas the inferior longitudinal will do the opposite, the curls the tongue longitudinally downwards and depressing the apex, shortens or retrudes the tongue and the transverse muscles will narrow and elongate or protrude the tongue, whereas the vertical muscles will flatten and broadens the tongue. <coughs> okay, now let's talk about the extrinsic muscles. The four extrinsic muscles elevate, <laughs> sorry, elevate, depress, and protrude and retract the tongue. The extrinsic muscles are innervated by hypoglossal nerve and the vagus nerve. And the, the palatoglossus is the only muscle that is supplied by the vagus nerve. So, the muscles that makes the extrinsic muscles are the genioglossus, hyoglossus, styloglossus, and the palatoglossus. So the genioglossus is the prime mover of a tongue and it makes up the most of a deeper bulk. And the hyoglossus depresses the tongue, especially pulling its side inferiorly and helps shorten or retrude the tongue. The styloglossus retrudes the tongue and elevates its side, working with the genioglossus to form a central th trough during swallowing. The palatoglossus will elevate the posterior tongue or depressing the soft palate. The most commonly act to close the fauces. Now let's talk about the innervation of the tongue, starting from the motor supply. All muscles of a tongue, except the palatoglossus, is supplied by the hypoglossal nerve. Again, the, the palatoglossus is supplied by the vagus nerve. And all the nerve fiber type of these muscles are GSE. So this is easy. But the sensory innervation is a little bit more difficult. As we discussed Previously, we need to separate the tongue into the two parts, the anterior two-third and the posterior one-third. So the anterior two-third of the tongue is supplied by the lingual nerve, which is, sorry, the lingual nerve and the caudal tympani nerve. The lingual nerve is a branch of the trigeminal nerve, especially the mandibular branch of a trigeminal nerve, which picks up the taste, sorry, it picks up the general sensation of this area. So the lingual nerve supplies the general sensation of the anterior two-third of the tongue, whereas a quarter tympani nerve, which is a branch of the facial nerve, will pick up the taste of this area. So the lingual nerve is a branch of the, the nerve fiber type for the lingual nerve is a GSA, and the quarter tympani is an SVA. And this is because although the tongue is made by 16 muscles, when we discuss about the taste, the tongue is part of the digestive system, and hence, when we when, when we are regarding the taste, it is a visceral. It becomes a visceral structure. That's why the quarter tympani nerve is uh, SVA. Now, the posterior one third of the tongue is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve in both 
taste as well as the um, general sensation. Oh, so this is a summary. The so general sensation, touch, and temperature is the lingual nerve will supply the anterior two third of the tongue, and the glossopharyngeal nerve will supply the posterior one third. For the taste, the quarter tympani supplies the anterior two third. And again, the glossopharyngeal nerve will supply the posterior one-third of the tongue. So this is a summary of oral innovation of oral cavity in the tongue. So the oral cavity is supplied by the trigeminal nerve, which is by the mandibular and the maxillary branch. Forces is by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the tongue is by, uh, depending on the anterior one-third, sorry, anterior two-third of the posterior one-third, the glossopharyngeal will supply all the sensation of posterior one-third, whereas a branch of the trigeminal nerve will supply the anterior two-third for general sensation, and the branch of facial nerve will supply the taste of the anterior two-third of the tongue. Now, let's talk about the blood supply and the venous drainage. This is simple. The blood supply to the tongue is by the lingual artery. So the arteries of the tongue derived from the lingual artery is arising from the external carotid artery here. And on entering the tongue, the lingual artery passes deep to the, hy the hypo sorry, hyoglossus muscle. And the main branch of the lingual arteries are the dorsal lingual artery, which supplies the anterior part of the tongue and the dorsal and deep arteries communicate with each other near the apex of the tongue. Now we also have the sublingual artery here, which supplies the sublingual gland and the floor of the mouth. The veins of a tongue are mainly by the lingual vein, and we have a dorsal lingual vein, which uh, accompanies the lingual artery and the deep lingual vein will uh, begin at the apex of a tongue and run posteriorly beside the lingual frenulum to join the sublingual vein. Now importantly all lingual veins will terminate at the internal jugular vein. <laughs> 